Hello, friends. If I haven't met you before, my name is Brian, and uh, man, I'm excited to be with you today. Whether you're joining us online or whether you're in the room, I'm just expectant for what God's going to do. You know, this past week, I got to speak at the Squalicum High School Baccalaureate, and it was interesting because it's been a while since I had to introduce myself, and I was trying to figure out what I should say. And so I said, my name is Brian, I love my family, I love my wife Kristen, and I need you to know on the front end that my two girls, Brooklyn and Addison, are both cuter than you were as kids. <laughs> I was trying to make friends on the front end. I told them that I love my job. I told them that I love coffee and Formula One and playing golf and video games and fantasy football and finishing my days by watching old episodes of The Office on my parents' Peacock account. I even gave them a bonus fact. I told them that when I go to the movies, I like to order those big buckets of popcorn with extra butter and extra salt, and I like to eat it all by myself because I'm a boss. Can I get an amen? Man, we are an excited crew. I love it. I didn't expect that I would get an applause for popcorn, but I will take it. And usually that's where I would stop, but this time I kept going because I thought the last thing that these kids need to hear is a shallow list of my casual interests. So I took a risk and I dug a little deeper and I told them that I've spent my entire life caring way too much about what people think and I told them that recently I had to delete my Instagram account because I got too obsessed with it and I told them that throughout my life I've struggled with self-esteem and depression and I told them that I absolutely hate letting people down. I'm a chronic procrastinator. I have a hard time making decisions. I cuss under my breath when I'm in traffic and I've lived most of my life with a crippling fear of failure. I said, so if you want to know who's standing in front of you today giving you a rah-rah speech about taking on the world, this is it. <laughs> like, this is what we're dealing with today, and I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. But if I'm honest, sometimes I feel more fearful than I do wonderful. Friends, I've been working in church for 10 years now, and I can't speak for you, but I find myself increasingly disinterested in Christian platitudes and bumper sticker answers. And this is my 35th time around the sun, and if I'm honest, I find myself increasingly disinterested with what people are posting on social media, really at the core of it. I just want to ask, is it okay if we talk about the real stuff? Like, when are we going to talk about the pain and the problems and the fear that we all feel? It's like, yes, I know your Instagram account looks beautiful. That's great, and that's fine, and that's wonderful. But what I'm starting to wonder is if we've gotten so good at pretending to be good that we've forgotten how desperately it is that we need God. Because sometimes the stories that we tell don't just impact other people. We actually start to believe them if we say them enough, and I'm afraid somewhere along the way that we've forgotten our great need. And right now we're in the middle of this series called Fish, and we're looking at Jonah, and I love the story of Jonah because he's in such a desperate place that he can't pretend anymore. And he's at the end of himself, so he's forced to face the fact that he needs help. And sometimes in our stories and in our lives, the most loving thing that God can do for us is to bring us to a place where we can't pretend anymore. And we're forced to face the fact that we need help. And today we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 2. But before we get to the text, I just want to pray for us. And so if you bow your head, Holy Spirit. God, we just sense your presence in this place. You say where two or more are gathered, there you are. So God, we see you. God, help us to be in tune with you. God, to hear your still soft voice. God, to be emboldened, not just to hear you, God, not just to see you, but God, to actually wrestle with what it is that you're calling us to do. God, what it is in our hearts that you're calling us to change. God, if there's pride that needs to fall away, God, would it fall? Jesus, we want to look more like you. We are not interested in easy answers to complicated questions, God. What we need is more of you. So would you make a way for us to see you, to hear you, to know you, God, and to follow you like never before? We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen and amen. So last week, Grant shared about Jonah chapter 1. We learned that God asked Jonah to go. Jonah said, no. God said, hold my root beer. He sent a great storm. Jonah got thrown overboard. And today I want to pick up the story in Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. And we're going to read all the way through to the end of chapter 2. So if you've got your Bible, you can pull that out. If not, it's going to be up here on the screens for you. 
So Jonah, starting in chapter 1, verse 17, says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths and into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me, all your waves, and the breaker swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. Final verse says, and Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to tell him the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. What a beautiful verse that is. There's not too many verses in scripture with the word vomit in it, so you've really got to enjoy it when you can. But today, here's how I want to start. I want to start with a question. And this question actually has the capacity, if you let it, to save you a lot of strife in your life. Here's my question for you. The question is, is this my storm? Is this my storm? I wonder by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been in trouble because of something that somebody else did? Keep your hands up if somebody else has gotten in trouble because of something that you did. You know, I think it's interesting. This week I was studying the text and I noticed that the storm was sent for Jonah. It wasn't sent for the sailors. And yet because the sailors out of the kindness of their heart let Jonah onto their boat, they now had to share in Jonah's storm. It's not that they did anything wrong. It's just that they let the wrong person onto their boat. And it got me thinking, I wonder if there are storms in your life that don't actually have anything to do with you. And I'm not talking about passing the buck. I'm not talking about shirking responsibility. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. Have you ever actually taken account of your life and asked the question, is all this drama surrounding me really mine, or is it just the chaos of the people that we've allowed to get close to us? Like, is this really my storm? Because if it's my storm, then God, teach me what you need to teach me. But if it's not, then Lord, help me to see what it is that I need to let go of that I've been holding on to. Show me the chaos that isn't actually mine to carry. Friends, some of you right now are in the middle of a storm that has nothing to do with you. Some of you are in the middle of a storm, not because of something that you did, but something because, or, but because of someone that you let onto your boat. And the th best thing that you could actually do in this moment is actually reevaluate re your crew. Say, so what of this is mine to carry and what of this is mine to let go of? You gotta ask the question, is this my storm? And in this case, this was in fact Jonah's storm. He had nobody to blame but himself. He gets thrown into the sea and he is sinking. And maybe that's what your life feels like right now. It feels like you're sinking. And if that's not where you find yourself. Amazing, enjoy this moment, but I'm here with the good news today that the storm will come for you too. So be sure to take notes because even if this isn't where you currently are, this will be someday where you are. I'm calling this talk, what to do when you're sinking. What to do when you're sinking. And here's my first idea, it's pretty simple, but when we're sinking, the first thing that we need to do is look for God. We've gotta look for God. Jonah 1 verse 17 says, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The key word here I would say is provided, provided. And I love this verse because it shows us that sometimes God's provision doesn't always look the way that we think it's gonna look. God's provision doesn't always feel the way that we think it's gonna feel. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I would guess that if Jonah could have written down a list of all the different ways that he wanted to be saved, that being swallowed whole by a fish was not on that list. 
That's why we need to look for God when we're sinking, because oftentimes in the storm, it's not so easy to see what it is that God's trying to do. We want a boat. God gives us a fish. We want to turn into Aquaman and grow some scales. God sends something with scales to come and swallow us whole. We want it to be sudden. God wants to take his time. We want a miracle. God gives us a miracle, but it's not the miracle that we were looking for. Sometimes we don't see God in the storm because he doesn't take on the form that we expect him to. So we need to look for God in whatever form of help that comes our way and see his presence through it all. We are called to not just sink, but to look for God when we're sinking because he will send help. Second idea is this, when you're sinking, we need to call out to God. So we need to call out to God, which means we need to pray to God. This whole chapter really is just a prayer that Jonah has prays from the belly of this fish. It's literally Jonah crying out to God in his moment of need. Scripture says in Jonah 2 verse 1, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed. So why would he be praying in the belly of a fish? Simply put, Jonah prays because God listens to our prayers, God partners with our prayers, and God answers our prayers. So from the inside of the fish, Jonah starts to pray, but it's not just that Jonah prayed, it's actually how Jonah prayed that I actually want us to notice. And there's three things that he does that I think that we could definitely learn from. The first thing is this, he prays with passion. He prays with passion. Jonah says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. So friends, this isn't an obligatory prayer. This is a distressed prayer. It's a passionate prayer. It's a desperate call for help. Sometimes the gift of desperate situations in your life is that it brings you to a place where you can start praying desperate prayers. And here's what you need to know. God loves answering the prayers of desperate people. Jonah isn't treading water praying, now I lay me down to sleep, or some other rote prayer that he's prayed a hundred times and knows the words so much that he doesn't even have to think about them. He's saying, God, I need help. Here's my question, church. When's the last time that you were desperate with God? When's the last time that you went to your knees crying out to God with distress because you needed him to move? Because I can promise you this, God is not sitting up in heaven wondering if you're going to say it right, if you're going to use the right vernacular or the right verb tense. What he really wants to know, what he's intrinsically concerned with, is do you care deeply enough about what you're asking him to get desperate with him? He wants to know, will you pray with passion? Will you pray from your guts? Second idea is this, he prayed with Precision. I love Jonah because he's not just passionate, he's precise. He says, you hurled me into the depths, Lord. The breakers swept over me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. He's not throwing up some generalized prayers to God. He's giving God the play-by-play of everything that he had just gone through. Friends, I, I remember a couple years back, we had a staff meeting out in the commons. The commons is where you walk through to get into this room right here. And when we had the staff meeting, what happens is we circle up. There's about 60 of us in total at the time. And what happens is people will share about their ministry. Sometimes they share about their life. And I'll never forget this particular meeting because there was this gal who was sharing. If I'm honest, I couldn't tell you exactly what she said because I was a little bit distracted. But whatever she said was pretty moving. People were pretty moved by it. It must have been pretty raw and real and emotional because the tears started to flow around the context of the circle. And to this day, I have no idea what she said, but I'll never forget the words that Grant said the second that she was done sharing. Because he looked straight at me from across the circle and he said, Brian, will you pray for that? (laughs) And I'll be honest, in that moment, I wanted to die. In that moment, I wanted to crawl into a hole and disappear and stay there forever. It's like, yes, Grant, I would love to pray for that. The only issue is I don't know what that is. But rather than admit it in the moment, I started praying the most generic prayer you've ever heard in your life. (laughs) I said, Lord, I thank you that you are good. (laughs) Lord, I thank you that you know exactly what it is that we need. Here's a pro tip. If you don't know what to pray, just start praying to God, thanking him for stuff. I said, thank you that you are the God of peace, and we pray for your peace right now. 
And under my breath, I'm like, mostly for me, not for anybody else around here. I said, I thank you, Lord, that you're in control and that you know exactly what we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And even though I don't think everyone knew, I'm pretty sure that she knew that I had no idea what I was talking about. And even if she didn't know, I knew that I knew. And most importantly, I knew that God knew that I certainly had no idea what I was asking him for. Friends, I'm here today to tell you that sometimes, Lord, I thank you that you are good isn't good enough. Sometimes, Lord, you know exactly what we need isn't what a moment actually requires of us. God's inviting us to be way more precise when we tell him how we feel and what we need and what we see. It's not that he needs your help actually recalling the details of a situation. He's doing just fine in that department. What he wants to know is, are you listening? What he wants to know is, are you watching? Are you paying attention to what I'm doing? Are you engaged in this moment? Do you see the details around you? Friends, in this moment, Jonah is saying, God, this sucks, and here's why. You threw me into the depths, which means he's saying I'm overwhelmed. He says, the breakers are sweeping over me, which is another way to say I feel like I've lost all control. He says, the seaweed is wrapped around my head. He's saying, God, I feel trapped. Jonah's not just praying with passion. He's praying with precision. He's telling God exactly what he feels because God cares. Finally, God wants us to pray with persistence. Because when we pray, it's not just the volume of our prayers that God listens to, it's the consistency. And this is true with kids too. I can always tell what my kids really want, not because they ask for it loudly, but because they ask for it repeatedly. Brooklyn, over the past six months, has probably asked about for, for approximately 482 different things for her birthday. And these things range in value and scope from sticker packets to a full-sized airplane so that she can fly back and forth to Alaska. So that's a whole thing. But usually what happens is she'll see something that she wants and she'll ask for it once and then she'll promptly forget about it. And when she forgets, I forget. But she has this one book that she keeps by her bedside and almost every night she has me read it. And whenever we read it, she has me stop on the same page so that she can point to the same picture of the same Elsa dress from Frozen. And she says the same thing that she's already said to me a hundred times before. She said, this is what I want for my birthday. And I'm just telling you, when it comes time to shop for her birthday present, I'm not looking at the other 481 things. I'm looking at that one thing because she has made it abundantly clear to me what it is that she wants. Friends, I wonder, what are the things that you keep coming back to with God? What are the pictures that you're pointing at saying, God, this is the thing that I want more than anything? I wonder, maybe it's a healing, maybe it's financial, maybe it's a son or a daughter or a mother or a father or a friend who doesn't know the Lord. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a strained relationship that actually needs God to come in and do some healing. Whatever it is, I feel like I'm here today to tell you to keep knocking on that door. Keep asking because God listens to you. He hasn't forgotten you and your story's not done. He invites us to pray persistent prayers. And at the end of his prayer, Jonah says in Jonah 2, verse 9, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I vowed I will make good, I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And I love the progression of this prayer because it starts as a desperate cry, but by the end it actually ends in a song of praise. And here's my final thought for today. When we're sinking, we need to praise God. So we need to look for God, we need to call for God, and then we actually need to praise God. Jonah says, but I with shouts of grateful praise. And that word praise that Jonah uses is an interesting one. A few years back, we did this whole series on all the different Hebrew words for praise. And the word that Jonah uses here is the specific praise word Toda. It looks like tauda, but it's toda. And what it means is it's an extension of the hand. It's thanksgiving. It's a confession. It's a sacrifice of praise. But most notably, it's the thanksgiving for things not yet received. So toda is actually a preemptive praise. It's a praise thanking God for things that he hasn't even done yet. 
And I just want you to get this picture. Jonah's still in the fish. He's spent the last couple days being slowly digested while he's complaining about the rough waters that he's just found himself in. But as he's praying to God, as he's literally going through and lamenting every detail of his journey, something begins to happen in his heart. There's a holy shift that's happening, and the more that he prays, the more he starts to remember that his story isn't actually about the struggles that he's gone through. It's about the God who brought him out of those struggles. And the more that he prays, the more he remembers that his story was never about the pit. It was about the God who pulled him out of the pit. Verse 6 says, it was you, Lord, who brought my life up from the pit. He says, it was you, Lord, who I remembered when my life was ebbing away, and it was you who saved me. It was you, Lord. Friends, I want to remind you today that your story, my story, our story isn't about the storms that we've been through. It's about the God who has brought us through the storms. I want to remind you that your story isn't about the pit that you found yourself in. It's about the God who pulled you out of the pit. My story is not of my struggle. My story is the fact that I was literally dead. I had no breath to actually call out and ask for help from God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved me, made me alive. Our story is about the fact that Jonah's not the only one who was inside and entombed for three days. There was another who actually came out the other side and was resurrected so that there could be a way for me to be alive. And when we realize that our story is really his story, we can praise him regardless of what we see because we can know just like Jonah knew that salvation comes from the Lord. And no sooner does he start to praise than he gets spit out. Scripture says, and I'm just going to see how many times we can say this word in this sermon, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. It vomited him. I repeat, it vomited him onto the dry land. And I don't think that it's random that the, the fish spits Jonah out just the next verse after he starts singing. Friends, I believe that this Toda praise is actually the precursor and the prelude to the breakthrough in Jonah's life. I believe that this praise was the thing that reminded him what it was that he was created to do. Friends, I'm here today to tell you that there is a praise that can actually shift your perspective. There is a praise that can change your heart. There is a praise that can remind you that even when it feels like you're sinking, you have a God who won't let you sink. Can I get three amens? I want to close with this. Our youngest daughter, Addie, is two years old now, and I'm absolutely obsessed with her. Maybe you'll understand this as parents. Maybe this is just a me thing, but I could literally just watch her chew on her food for the rest of my life and be a happy man. Like, how cute is she? She's that cute that all I need is to just watch her chew, and I am just endlessly entertained. Recently, she started doing this thing where she calls out to her mom at the most random moments throughout the day. She'll say, Mom! Mom, I need you. She'll say, Mom, I need you. And she does not stop yelling until she gets what she needs. And it's only if and when her mom's not around that she changes her tune. And she'll say, Dad, Dad, I need you. And I love it when she calls for me because I'm always curious to see what it is that she needs. Usually it's not the big things, it's the little things. She'll say, Dad. I need you, and I'll say, what do you need, sweet girl? And she said, I need you to hold me. And I'll look at her, and I'll, I'll say, you know, I think that's what I need, too. Other times, she'll, she'll say, I need you. I'll say, what do you need? She says, I need you to read me a book. She said, I need you to pull up my blanket. These are all real examples. I need you to wipe my boogies. She said, I need you to tickle me. She said that the other day. I said, you got it, girl. Most recent one, she said, I need you so I can show you something magic. I said, I think I need that too, girl. But here's what I want you to see, church. When she asks for help, there's not an ounce of shame in her request. When she asks me for help, there's not even a hint of embarrassment in her ask. There's no disgrace. There's no feeling that she has somehow failed or let me down because she has to say, I need you. There's no painful admission for her. This is just a simple statement of fact. Dad, I need you. 
Got me thinking, why do I always feel like a failure when I say, I need you? Got me thinking, why is it so difficult for me to actually admit to myself, to the people around me, and even to God, that God, I need you? I started thinking, what if the invitation to being childlike is the invitation to ask for help without any shame at all? To say, I'm not ashamed, this is just a statement of fact, I'm a human, you are God, I need you. Friends, this is my whole message. Don't wait to be swallowed by a fish before you admit that you need God. Don't be embarrassed by the fact that you actually have to call out and say, God, I need you. Don't wait for the crisis to call on the name of Christ. Don't wait for the low moments in your life to lift your hand high and praise with total praise for what hasn't even happened yet. Don't wait another minute to call out with the confidence of a toddler saying, God, I need you. Friends, so pray your practice prayers. Pray your fly-by prayers. Pray your now I lay me down to sleep. Pray them all and pray them often. But don't forget to pray with passion. Don't forget to take the gloves off and tell God how you really feel. He can handle it. He's not afraid of your frustrations. He's not offended by your fears. So bring him your desperate prayers and your broken prayers. Bring him your big prayers and your small. And you can always be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, we need you. God, would that not be an embarrassed admission, but God, rather just a statement of fact. God, we need you. Whether we see our storm on the surface or it's deep inside of us and there's layers and layers of protection, God, that we've just forgotten about. It doesn't change the fact that we need you. God, would we look for you in the storm? Would we cry out to you with passion, persistence? And precision, God, not because you need help with the details, but because you care about the most finite, small details of our lives. That's how big you are, that you care about the small. We love you, Lord. God, we need you. Help us to see that. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So we're going to respond. Will you stand with me? And God, we're going to sing, I need you. And here is my invitation to you today. Would this not be anything that even has a shroud of embarrassment? Would this be a proud declaration, just the statement of the fact that, God, I need you? Whether you feel like you're sinking or not does not change the truth of that fact. So let's respond and let's sing together that we need our God.